Someone once said, the star that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And you could apply that quote to any number of uh, Hollywood stars that uh, when at their absolute peak in their career, uh, they were taken from us for one reason or another. Um, whether it's uh, self-inflicted or accidental or murder. Um, and that seems to be the case more often than not. And you can't help but uh, be left wondering what might have been, you know, had they uh, not been taken from us uh, at such a young age, what was next for them? You know, when, when you talk about John Belushi, there was uh, the word on the street was that he was going to be in Ghostbusters before yep. uh, he, uh, his life was tragically cut short. And Chris Farley, from what I heard, well, a project that was a passion project of his, uh, he wanted to play Fatty Arbuckle in a, a, bi- a biopic about Fatty Arbuckle. And I, you just got to wonder what wow. might have been. That would have been fantastic. Wow. Uh, any celebrities come to mind uh, immediately when you think about stars that were taken uh, so quickly from us when they were at the peak of stardom? Peak of stardom? N- Kurt Cobain? Yeah. Or, or are we just talking actor? Like no, Hollywood I'm talking actors. celebrities. You oh, know? man. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hendrix. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. River Phoenix. Yeah. 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 Joplin. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so it's unfortunate. But, you know, I guess on the plus side is uh, they'll be forever young. That's how we'll always see them. You know, we'll always picture a young Marilyn Monroe. Imagine how different things might be if she would have lived to be 90. You know? right, right. So she's eternally youthful. I guess that's one of the the uh, bonuses of uh Cutting out early is uh, you'll always remember uh, at your peak, you know. Uh, unfortunately, I'm past my peak, so I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, good. I'm gonna, come on, easy, Joe. I'm going to hang on for a little bit there for him. Um, so segueing that into uh, my first topic here today, um, my topic is going to cover uh, a couple of names that were taken from us at a, a, a young age, taken too soon. And coincidentally, all of these actors have something in common And that is they all acted in the movie Rebel Without a Cause. Um, Now, you know, there are movies out there that people say were cursed because several actors met uh, strange or horrible demises. Um, But that definitely applies to Rebel Without a Cause. Uh, The the three main actors all were taken fairly young. um, And uh, there's another actor in the movie that... um, Lived a little bit longer, but just had a sad demise. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Rebel Without a Cause is a 1955 Warner Brothers movie uh, directed by Nicholas Ray. Uh, It starred James Dean, Natalie Wood, and Sal Mineo. uh, And in a supporting role, Jim Backus. Uh, Miss, Mr. Howell from Killigan's Island. Oh, yeah. So you might it's been include years since I've seen the movie. I do not remember that. <laughs> you might include him in the curse of uh, that he got stuck acting in Gilligan's Island for a number of years. <laughs> oh, we're just taking shots of classic TV here, Joe. Come on. <laughs> oh, lovey. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite uh, lines from Jim Backus in the Gilligan's Island uh, show is when they were directing a movie. You remember they did like a silent film on Gilligan's Island? And every time they were getting ready to start a scene, he would look up in the trees and go, quiet up there, you birds. And I just love that. And he also had a great line. Uh, when they finally watched the movie, he said, I'd walk out of that picture on an airplane. And I love <laughs> that line. That's a great line. Um, so Rebel Without a Cause was filmed in and around Los Angeles, including the beautiful Griffith Observatory, where the main climactic scene takes place. Uh Um, There were a lot of locations on Warner Brothers. If you tour the Warner Brothers lot, you'll see locations that were used in Rebel Without a Cause, including the uh, police department. Uh, It was a big hit, uh, grossed $4.5 million on a $1.5 million budget. Keep in mind, this was in 1955, so those were Huge, huge numbers, and obviously it has a cult following. It's considered a classic, Um, and, you know, of course, James Dean gives an unforgettable performance in that film. Uh, Now, speaking of James Dean, uh, he was a method actor, and uh, some people, you know, this was early on in the introduction of method acting. There was, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Why am I drawing a blank from The Godfather? Marlon Brando. Brando. Uh, He was a method actor, and this was this new new method of of acting that uh, was on the scene, and uh, it alienated some of his co-stars. Other people were mesmerized by him. 
Uh, but when he started filming Rebel Without a Cause, he only had one film under his belt, and that was East of Eden, which was directed by um, Elia Kazan. Am I pronouncing his name right? Uh, or is it Elia? Is it Elia? Elia Kazan, the famous director? Yeah, I, I um, don't know. But, yeah, so he had that under his belt, and based on the strength of his performance in East of Eden, uh, the director, Nicholas Ray, just did not want anyone else for Rebel Without a Cause. He wanted James Dean in that role so bad. Uh, now, at the time when Rebel was, was getting uh, underway um, and Nicholas Ray was collaborating with writers trying to formulate the story, which um, borrowed a title from a nonfiction book but has nothing to do with the rest of the nonfiction book. He just liked the title. Um, and as they were planning and, and trying to figure out the direction this movie was going to go, um, the director, Nicholas Ray, lived at Chateau Marmont. Uh, which is the subject of a book I just finished called The, the Castle on Sunset. And so that was uh, ground zero for Rebel Without a Cause. Actors would come there and rehearse, and uh, they'd write new pages, and they all met at this hotel on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood, which is I find really fascinating. Um, so when, uh, based again on his, the strength of uh, James Dean's performance in East of Eden, uh, when Warner Brothers got word uh, of the success of that picture and, and James Dean was on his way, they, they decided to upgrade the movie um, from a B-movie black and white picture to an A picture. They decided to put more money into it, and because of that, they filmed it in color. And since they were filming in color, they went with the genius move of putting uh, James Dean in that famous red windbreaker that just is so iconic, so iconic. Um, just an amazing image when you think about, you know, 50s movies and classic movies. I mean, people still dress up as it was Holly in, in, uh, for Halloween right now. You exactly. Can still, you can still call, call it out. You're like, oh, James Dean. Exactly. <laughs> the white T-shirt, blue jeans, yeah. red windbreaker, mm -hmm. the hairdo and everything. It was just such an iconic look. Um, and that had a lot to do with uh, Warner Brothers deciding to go with a color picture. Um, now, uh, a lot went into the filming of the movie. Uh, they finished filming. And then immediately after filming Rebel Without a Cause, Dean went off and started another film called Giant with Elizabeth Taylor and Rock Hudson. And that was a major film. Uh, I didn't like it as much as Rebel and East of Eden, but it was a huge film. Uh, in a big deal for James Dean. And, and he was on his way. This guy was going to be one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. But as luck would have it, on September 30th, 1955, uh, after completing uh, the filming of Giant, and neither Rebel or Giant had been even edited yet, they hadn't even been released, uh, he was big into cars. James Dean was a racer. And he had just gotten his uh, Porsche Spider 550, um, and he wanted to take it to a road race in Salinas. Um, so I remember talking to George Barris about this. George Barris is a car customizer, and uh, he did some uh, work on James Dean's Porsche Spider. And I asked him about James Dean, and uh, he says he remembers talking to James Dean before he left for the road race. He said, let's trailer it. To the racetrack and James Dean said no nah, I, I want to get a feel for it I kind of want to break it in and there were other people in his ear saying yeah why don't you drive it there get a feel for it so George Barris tried to talk him out of it okay uh, other people talked him into it um, so at about 3 30 he got a speeding ticket uh, and you could find scans of the speeding ticket online then at about 5 45 just a couple hours later on route 466 um, a 1950 Ford two-door driven by 23-year-old student Donald Turnipseed was coming at James Dean and made a left turn right in front of him. And Dean had a passenger in his car, a mechanic uh, named Rolf Wotherich. And um, Rolf was like, do you see this guy turning? And Dean is like, I see him. And People suspect that because of his racing instincts, he hit the gas to see if he can blow by this guy. Um, unfortunately, he, he T-boned the car, went right into it. Car spun out of control. The mechanic, Rolf, was uh, thrown from the car and survived. He was literally thrown clear of the wreckage and survived. Wow. Uh, meanwhile, um, Dean was trapped in the car, and when uh, paramedics were, uh, you know, uh, when they came to see if they can rescue him, uh, he was dead. His neck was broken. 
Um, and so at the hospital, he was pronounced dead at 6.20 p.m. Uh, 24 years old, uh, James Dean. Sure. And um, it's uh, such a huge loss. And uh, after he died, um, both Rebel Without a Cause and Giant were released, and people went nuts. And uh, James Dean continued to get fan mail at Warner Brothers long after his death. Um, and it became this huge phenomenon. I mean, if, if you were to make sort of a, mo- a modern-day comparison, it's, it's kind of like um, Brandon Lee. Like, he had filmed The Crow, uh, but before The Crow can know. get released, uh, he was shot on set uh, in a horrible accident. And so here you are watching this movie in theaters where he plays a guy who gets killed and comes back to life. Um, and there he is on the screen, and, and it, it's hard to register that he's gone because there he is. But there is James Dean on the screen in, Wait, in these was, great was, movies. Was Brandon Lee shot by Alec Baldwin also? <laughs> no, he was not. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, he, uh, <laughs> I'd be really uh, suspicious of Alec Baldwin if he did that multiple times. Um, so, yeah, so uh, James Dean was originally, uh, he grew up in uh, Indiana. I visited his hometown, uh, got access to his home and stuff like that, which was really, really cool. And he's, uh, he's buried in Fairmount, Indiana, in their cemetery. Um, his tombstone was stolen, to add one more footnote I mean, on this story, uh, in 1983. Uh, it was discovered four years later, but uh, after they had replaced it. Um, but, yeah, I got a tour of his home, and uh, one amazing moment for me was his cousin, Marcus, who currently lives in Dean's boyhood home, uh, took us to this nondescript building it looked like maybe an insurance office or something and he took us in unlocks this door and you see cars and memorabilia and all sorts of stuff a motorcycle right and uh he says here have a seat in this car and it was like a burgundy car i I think it was a ford i can't remember exactly i sat behind the wheel i said what's the significance of this car and his cousin said james dean took this car to prom Oh. And I was sitting behind the wheel with my hands on the steering wheel going, I should not be sitting in this car. It was really amazing. You know, um, what's that? Now that you say that, my I'm just remembering this. My freshman year of college, I went with a couple of friends to that to the J- James Dean Festival. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in Indiana. Right. Yeah. yeah. They have it every year, yeah. Yeah, and it was a very strange experience, very – it was it was like a little town like that time forgot kind of yeah it oh. really and it, yeah. uh anyway like, like i just Pleasantville or something like that? Yeah, well there's, there was something kind of creepy about the little town oh, no. i i don't know what it was but it was me and a, a girl i was dating at the time and uh two or three other friends wow and so, yeah we we were going to albion at the time so it was just yeah. uh, about like an hour drive down yeah from there yeah so where'd you put the tombstone what you do with it? <laughs> See, yeah, my thing with the tombstone, why would you steal something like that? Who do you get to show that yeah. off to? It's like stealing the Mona Lisa. You see, that? that's the real Mona Lisa. Yeah. I don't think How you should do be you owning brag? that. Yeah, it's it's so demented, and I'm sure alcohol played a role. Right. <laughs> Speaking of alcohol, let's move on to the next casualty of uh, Rebel Without a Cause. Um, obviously, James Dean's story is the most famous, but right, right up there is Natalie Wood. Um, of course, Natalie Wood was a famed child uh, actress. She was in Miracle on 34th Street. Oh, that's um, right. And yeah. uh, so she was already a star long before Rebel. But she had always been told by her parents, her mother uh, specifically, what role she was going to take. She never really had any say in the roles that she uh, took. And it wasn't until Rebel uh, came along where she's like, I want that part. There's a part for a teenage girl. I know I'm perfect for it. So she heavily campaigned for it to the point where when Nicholas Ray would go out to a club or whatever, Natalie would show up, flirt with him, and try to convince him that she was perfect for the part. And he didn't see it. Um, So he kept searching to fill that role. Meanwhile, a 16-year-old Natalie basically threw herself at this director, and they began a love affair. He was 44 at the time. All right, there we go. She was 16. I was waiting for this because I was like, (laughs) when does perseverance become stalking and then then it's getting to something? Oh, wow. Yeah, and so even then, after they started the relationship, he still wasn't 
convinced that she was right to, for the role. Well, <laughs> well Simon, yeah. go ahead. He's committed statutory rape, and he's still not sure if he should. At <laughs> yeah. that point, you give her the role. Yeah, exactly. But you're going to prison. So I guess he, you know, I have to imagine he dangled it like a carrot, you know, to let her think that maybe she had a shot. I don't know. Oh, wow. Well, simultaneously, while she was having this uh, love affair with the director, she also was uh, dating um, a young uh, Dennis Hopper. Really? And uh, they were driving. There were several people in the car, and they had a really serious car accident. And again, uh, Natalie was thrown from the car, uh, hospitalized. Uh, Nicholas Ray came to the hospital to check on her. She's bedridden. And while he's there visiting her, she overhears hospital staff go, oh, these damn juvenile delinquents. And she turned to him and said, did you hear that? They called me a juvenile delinquent. I am perfect for this role. And he cast her in that role after realizing <laughs> what a juvenile delinquent she really was. So she suffered. So her misfortune happens before the movie. Yes. Well, oh. sort of. It, the story goes on. But okay. that misfortune got her the role. Oh, wow. uh, in West Side Story? It, no, no, no. Or, in no, Rebel no. Without a Cause. In Rebel Without a Cause. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think West Side Story came later. Oh, yeah, 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 it was a yeah. couple yeah. years later. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So so she got the role in, in Rebel Without a Cause. They began filming that. She still carried on that relationship with the director, which is so bizarre. Uh, and she went on to have an amazing career in West Side Story, Gypsy, yep. in a movie I just watched the other day, The Great Race with Tony Curtis, uh, which oh, she was yeah. fantastic in. Haven't seen um, either one of those. Oh, that's yeah, a, no, a, they're, they're a lot of fun. They're great. Jack Lemmon's great in that movie. Oh, yeah. Professor yeah, Kate. he's so over the top. Yeah, yeah, he was just great. Uh, so let's fast forward to her final film, Brainstorm, which uh, they were filming in November of uh, 1981. They weren't quite done with it. They were almost done filming it. And this is the part that may sound familiar to everybody listening. Uh, Natalie was on a yacht with her husband at the time, Robert Wagner, and a co-star from Brainstorm, Christopher Walken, of all people. <laughs> and the story goes, and this, you, know, you read different sources and you hear different things online, um, but supposedly uh, Robert Wagner caught Natalie uh, flirting with Christopher Walken, and he was not ha happy. Everybody had some alcohol in their system. There's the, the captain, who was also on the, the yacht, Dennis Davern, D-A-V-E-R-N. Uh, he heard uh, Robert Wagner yelling at Natalie and her yelling back, and they were having a, a, you know words back and forth. Um, well, Natalie disappears off the boat. Uh, a witness heard a scream. Um, now one thing that's really suspicious, and I'm not accusing anybody of anything here just yet. Um, but for some strange reason, the captain said that Robert Wagner interfered with the search efforts. And I'm not sure what's happening there. She's off the boat. They suspect she may be in the water. The, the captain wanted to turn on a searchlight and Robert Wagner talked him out of it and like hampered those efforts. Yeah. Did it. So you mentioned a searchlight. Did it happen at night? Yes, it was okay. at night. I did yeah. not know that. Yeah, fact. so okay. everybody was like getting so, ready for bed and everything. Maybe he did some sort of misdirection to, oh, no, she <laughs> fell off that side of the boat. Uh, yeah. Who knows? So but the if, next. If, if that hearsay is true, then uh, I mean. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. nothing smells better than just saying hey guy uh, nothing to find here i guess we gotta call it guys <laughs> my, my, the woman here. who i'm married to I'm one like, of the most famous actresses of our time yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah bob this is your wife it's at night shouldn't we look for it i'm yeah. she'll she'll make it she knows where to go yeah she'll swim. i think it was actually robert wagner's character in austin powers was the one who <laughs> killed her. that's right number one yes number or one. number two number that's two. what number two that's yep, right number two so the next day uh natalie's body was found about a mile away from the ship uh, there was a, a dinghy uh, missing. Uh, the official account is she had some alcohol in her body. They, they, they also found painkillers in her system and seasick pills with alcohol in her system. Um, the official uh, conclusion is that after having their argument, she decided she wanted to leave the boat. She tried to climb into this dinghy. Uh, they did find scrapes and bruises and stuff like that, so it's possible she somehow slipped, hit the dinghy on the way out, fell in the water. 
Um, mm. But some people point to those scrapes and bruises that there was a physical altercation <laughs> on the boat as well. So it's hard to dismiss uh, the, the scrapes and bruises on Natalie's body. Do, um, do you think it's possible that uh, Wagner beat her up enough and got her maybe semi unconscious or semi conscious, put her in the dinghy and just kind of pushed it off? Don't know. I don't know. Um, unless, unless somehow, you know, they got into a physical altercation and somehow she went overboard and then he concocted a story and maybe untied the dinghy. I, I don't know. I mean, this isn't exactly the Titanic. There's a very limited amount of space on this boat. <laughs> I know. So I know. Am I, are we waiting for a Christopher Walken deathbed confession where he oh, finally tells us man. what happened? Wouldn't, wouldn't well, that's that be the thing. Something? <laughs> Walken was never considered a suspect. Um, I don't know if he slept through the whole thing. He was questioned multiple times as a witness. Um, after extensive investigation, uh, Wagner was named a person of interest. Right. We've heard that phrase before. At the very um, least. Yeah, and that, that was just a couple of years ago I read. Uh, I said as of 2018. Could be, yeah, yeah. Um, he was so, considered a person of interest. He has not and, been cleared of he, these accusations. What year did he pass away? It wasn't that long ago. He's still around. What, <laughs> Wagner, I, I, Wagner I, is still around I as a matter of fact. Away. Robert Wagner attended the Hollywood show, I think it was um, last year, with Stephanie Powers, who was his co uh, co star on Heart to Heart. There, he's still making appearances. Yeah. So imagine, Whoa. imagine okay. going this, this to changes an event. My whole, my, my whole mindset. <laughs> yeah, Wagner's not, Wagner just see, feels like he's gone because he hasn't made any Austin Powers movies. Yeah. Hey, fun but fact: what c- do you know? A city he was born in? I do not know. About thirty miles south of here. Really? In, what? De- in Detroit. He's a Detroit native. Yep. I had He's no 92 idea. years old. Uh, as if we need another thing on our, <laughs> right. on our plate. I had no idea. Wow. So Interesting. He was never officially cleared. Uh, Walken was never considered a suspect. Uh, eventually, uh, just, you know, it's considered unsolved and ruled an accident, I guess. But I, I, yeah. did, uh, I know Wagner's at least probably, what, 12 years older than... Uh, Walken. Walken's probably around 80 or so, late 70s. Could be, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, he probably doesn't have much time left. I wonder if there will be some sort of... Uh, Don't know. Unless he clings to that official you know? official ruling, I guess. Right or now, or right? maybe whenever Wagner passes away, Walken will, will come clean since yeah. he knew he was the one who did it. Yeah. Let's put this to rest. You know? Isn't it is, weird to think that there are two yeah. people who were on that ship that are still alive, still hanging <laughs> Famous, out today. Fa- very famous and they people. Both know or the captain. What or the uh, captain. Find yeah. that captain. We, yeah, try to track him or his Find his, his family. Kid. There's a de- there's <laughs> something like in a vault somewhere that de- yeah, granddad had this story. Never yeah. wanted to tell us. Now, uh, Natalie is buried at Westwood uh, Village Memorial Park, which I visited many times, mostly because Marilyn Monroe was there in a crypt. Um, oh. If you've never been, I know this sounds sort of morbid, but it's, it's a must see the most famous names in hollywood are all buried in westwood village memorial park dean martin uh betty page um uh everyone from uh uh what's his name uh from uh andy griffith show um uh barney fife oh, what's Bar- his name uh, i'm drawing oh. a blank why am i Donna? Donna. Donna. um so you walk around that cemetery uh walter Matthau, jack lemon everybody farrah fawcett rodney dangerfield right next to each other uh it's amazing to see all those famous names is but, it yeah. like a, in the west hollywood uh neighborhood it's or? um it's it right in the heart of la and you wouldn't oh, even okay. know it was there because uh it's all surrounded by walls and stuff and uh i, I remember first time i went to go visit it i, I didn't even know where it was and kept driving past it and then i saw this entrance and went into this entrance and there it was and you walk away and it's just the uh, you walk through it and it's the who's who of hollywood are buried in this cemetery so you think something oh, like that yeah. would get a little more picturesque consider it's hollywood like up in the hollywood hills yeah just move it no. out there there's say, other famous cemeteries out there that right. are like that very scenic but this one uh, i think is deliberately lawn, secluded of. like you know so you don't yeah. get a lot of looky loos but um it's uh if you're into that sort of thing i definitely recommend it um, and just to kind of wrap this up, I, I, I have a bunch of stuff here, but we're running long here. But Sal Minio, who's 16 uh, in this movie, yeah. uh, word on the street is he also had an affair with director Nicholas Ray, which mm. is uh, interesting. Mm. So Nicholas Ray, at 44, had a thing for 16-year-olds, male and female. Uh-huh. 
Uh, Sal Mineo, uh in 1976 was coming home from a play that he was in. Uh, he got out of his uh, car under his carport and was getting ready to head into his apartment when a guy jumped out, stabbed him right in the heart, killed him uh, in the alley. Uh, eventually they found the guy. His name was Lionel Ray Williams. His girlfriend said he had come home with uh, blood on his shirt and he had a long, long criminal record. Uh, so that was a case of Sal Mineo just being in the wrong place at the wrong time and uh, taken from us at 37 years old. Mm. Uh, he's buried in New York. Uh, and then Nick Adams, who had a small role as a gang, gang member in Rebel, uh, he, he also dated Natalie, was good friends with uh, James Dean. And on the night of February 7th, 1968, he was found dead uh, in his upstairs bedroom, slumped against the wall. Uh, his autopsy revealed sedatives and other drugs in his body. People that knew him didn't, they ha- had a hard time believing that he was taking drugs, but I think this was a case of being overprescribed and mixing medications. Okay. I think that's what caused his death. Uh, it was ruled an accident slash suicide, and it was revealed that his brother Andrew was a doctor and prescribed these sedatives to his brother, and I think he was just overprescribed. Uh, he was only 36, and uh, he's buried in Pennsylvania. Now, interesting footnote on Nick, Nick Adams. There's some speculation that he was murdered uh, due to the fact that he was planning to write a tell-all book. Um, most people speculate that he was bisexual and had relationships with men and women, and he was going to write a book, a big reveal, big tell-all, and uh, uh, coincidentally, he passed away. Um, so there is uh, some speculation that he may have been murdered, but I think the, the logical conclusion is that uh, he was overprescribed. And I feel the same thing happened to Elvis and Marilyn and people yeah. like that who, would, uh, at the time, they didn't have a good system for checking to see what meds you're already on when another do- doctor would prescribe oh, no. you with something. Yeah. And you would de- deliberately go to multiple doctors sure. to get what you needed. Sure. And if it was the wrong combination, it was lethal. And so I think that explains Nick's death but again he was he was young too uh too young 30 how do you know if they old. held if they would even hold the doctor's response because the doctors right. know that you know these guys go to multiple people yeah so they probably have some kind of clause in like hey this yeah this ha- if something happens if you're gonna tell me everything yeah and how do you say no to a maryland to an elvis uh right. they sure. i think they like that attention they like having those uh star clients and mm-hmm. then another footnote is just nicholas ray um he lived to be 66 but he, he was an alcoholic. He took drugs. People would say when they would meet up with him to discuss ideas, he was just slurring his speech there at the end. And um, he never recovered from James Dean's death. He was really close to him. And um, uh, he eventually uh, died of lung cancer. And, uh, or he was diagnosed with lung cancer. In 78, he had a brain tumor removed, and then he died of heart failure uh, in 79. Jeez. Um, so he had, uh, after Rebel, I mean, he's continued to work in Hollywood and overseas, but he had kind of a sad, pathetic life there at the end, too. So so is there a Rebel curse, uh, you could argue, uh, after reading all these stories, that uh, there must have been something about that set, something about that film that uh, doomed those participants? S- something um, about the director? Yeah, something about know. the... I mean... Well, the funny Chateau thing is, Marmont. did anything happen to the director? I'd be wondering about. I mean, did he right. did he die of cancer? Did he get hit by a truck? Well, because apparently, he didn't go to prison because he he's actually committed crimes. Yeah, and he lived a longer life. And uh, oh, and here's an interesting footnote. When I was reading that book about Chateau Marmont, trying to figure out what stars visited the chateau and who lived there, uh, when Nicholas Ray moved into a bungalow, he stayed there for a number of years. I think like six years at the chateau. Uh, early on, when he was staying there, he was courting a young Marilyn Monroe. Wow. And so that chateau, which is now known as the director's uh, bungalow, uh, is where he romanced Marilyn Monroe, Natalie Wood, and all sorts of uh, other Wait, ongoings. Is, is that the, in the bungalow. official name right now? Is, is, is it exists? They or? refer to, oh, okay, to just... bungalow number two as the director's bungalow wow. because that's where Nicholas Ray stayed during the filming of uh, Rebel Without a Cause. So, but, lots but, of interesting but it's stories. The, it, the hotel itself is still open and called the Ch- yeah, that's, Chateau. Yeah, the Chateau is called Chateau Marmont. It's on uh, Sunset. It's named after the street that it's on. Okay. Um, it's going to be celebrating its 100th anniversary real soon. Wow. Lots of comings and goings and interesting stories. And just about every famous Hollywood name you can think of from actors to directors to writers to poets to musicians, they all stayed at the Chateau at one time or has, another. Has there ever been a... a- a movie that's like taking place 
There? Yes. As a matter of fact, it might be in my mailbox when I get home today. Um, Sophia Coppola uh, oh. did a film called Somewhere, I think it's called, and it was entirely filmed on the grounds of the Chateau. Oh, so wow. I can't wait to get home and watch that. It's about a movie star who's staying there. He's kind of a has-been. Okay. Um, and his young daughter comes to visit and stays with him. Um, uh, I haven't yeah. heard of that, but I, I like her as a director. Yeah, so it's I'm called Some, Somewhere? I think it's called Somewhere. Yeah, I'll verify that. Has there ever been a documentary on this place? I don't think I've seen a documentary, but that wow. book, The Castle on Sunset, is riveting. I, I read it in like four days, okay. and the stories are amazing. So many stories. You know, Gene Harlow lived there with, uh, I think it was after Paul Byrne. Okay. Um, one of the sadder stories, I'm getting a little off topic here, but one of the sadder stories there was there was a young couple living uh, at the Chateau, and the wife got pregnant. And both her and her husband decided this is no place to raise a baby. We have to get a home. So they found a, a home that was available that was being occupied at the time by Candace Bergen, of all people. Hmm. And Candace and whoever she was staying with, I don't know if it was a husband or a boyfriend or whatever, they were having some problems. They wanted to move out of this home. So this young couple right. that was at the Chateau moved into this house on Cielo Drive. And months later, they were slaughtered by the Manson family. <laughs> So they what? moved. It was Sharon Tate and her husband, um, uh, uh, Roman Polanski. He was overseas, but Sharon Tate was in the home uh, hosting friends and stuff, and they all got murdered by the Manson family. And, and Allegedly. Uh, <laughs> well, if, if we're no talking to word. Tarantino. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That... So, um, so that's a tragic story that had they not left the Chateau, right. Sharon Tate would be alive today. Wow. And it was just an unfortunate set of circumstances that took her to that rented home. And to think, had Sharon Tate not moved in that home, that could have been Candace Bergen that we would be reading about today um, who was occupying the home. Wow. Because Manson set his followers on this house and said, murder anyone who's there because Doris Day's son, and his name escapes me, he was a music producer, and he was living at that home. Okay, uh, He wasn't living at the home at the time, was renting it to Candace Bergen. And then when Candace Bergen moved out, rented it to Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski, and that's when the murders happened. But they were directed wow. to kill anyone in that home, hoping to take out Doris Day's record executive son. So it was just, again, wrong place, wrong time, and See, that's there's the definition a story. of a curse. Yeah. Wrong place, wrong time. I mean, exactly. That- yeah. Oh, I mean, that Chateau Mormont, I mean, the stories that have probably been, the deals that probably were made, you, I mean, you bring oh, yeah. in, you know, studio execs, you bring in anyone to come in there, and all the deals that are cut there, I would love to talk to the staff. Who, oh, yeah. It, it almost like, uh, you ever seen the movie The Grand Budapest Hotel? Oh, yeah, yeah. I love, I love that it. movie, yeah. Just imagine the staff there, but it's the, yeah. it's the Chateau Mormont. And, and, and they go in, the book goes into detail about the eccentric characters that work there and all the stories that were going on and, and how they love some of their guests. There was a, there was a photographer named uh, Helmut Newton, I believe was his name. He was kind of this like erotic photographer that photograph beautiful people in strange situations, partially clothed. And the staff absolutely loved him. And he would stay there for like the winter and then he would leave and go overseas and he'd come back and they celebrated his return with champagne when he came back and all the staff loved him. And one day he was exiting the uh, parking garage and as he came out of the exit to the to the hotel, he went directly across the street and crashed into a wall uh, where they pronounced him dead and found out that as he was exiting the hotel, he had a heart attack and died. And that's why the car accelerated and crashed into the wall. Oh, my god! So there's a little plaque on the wall that marks the spot where photographer Helmut Newton uh, died. And that's only, shockingly, with all the stuff that went on at the Chateau, there's only two famous deaths that took place there, Helmut Newton and John Belushi, who died in his bungalow. And oh. John Belushi is going to be a, a story for a future yeah. episode oh, of yeah, the yeah. Hollywood crime that, scene. That's, that's crazy to think of that place you said. It's almost 100 years old, and think, think of the hundreds or thousands of, inter- of wealthy uh, movers and shakers, and only yeah. two— famous Two famous deaths. deaths. An interesting wow. thing is prior to John Belushi dying— um, the Chateau was pretty much off the radar. Not a lot of right. people knew about it. And then all of a sudden, John Belushi dies, and John Belushi dies in seedy bungalow, and the hotel was like, what the hell are you talking about? Don't call us seedy. And it's had its ups and downs, but it wasn't right. until John Belushi's death where everybody knew about the Chateau. So, so it was, was kind of, it was, it, was, it was hip, 
um, but not it's still kind of under the radar. Yeah. Now, now what place would be like that today that that you would think of out in L.A. Oh, that's a good question. Without, without because, getting too far off topic, right? But yeah, I, I, I'm I'm curious. I'm trying to get a mindset of no, no, I, I what it would be topic. like I back in the in the seventies. It's the leg- it's the it's the legacy of the chateau. What who else could inherit the title? Yeah, right. Because the the cool thing about the chateau is that you went to the chateau if you didn't want to be seen, if you didn't want to be uh, ogled. Right. There were other places like the uh, the Garden of Allah where people wanted to be seen, wanted to be known for their debauchery and all the stuff that was going on. Right. And, and so it was hip, it was cool, it was out of the way. Once John Belushi died, now it became trendy and people wanted to go there and they ended up opening up a bar and a restaurant so you can say that you've eaten or had a drink at the Chateau. So it used to be secluded and out of the way. Now it's sort of trendy and gentrified, I guess. Um, so what today would be that escape for celebrities to not be noticed? I'm not sure. I mean, would it even be know. in LA? Does it, I don't even know yeah. if it has to be in LA anymore. It could be right. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, there was the Viper Room that was owned by Johnny Depp for a while. That was sort of a out of the way hangout for celebrities. But then when River Phoenix died there, then everyone became yeah. aware of the Viper Room. So it, is, I don't know. It, isn't there one close to the the Church's Scientology? Uh, the Roosevelt uh, on Hollywood Boulevard is an amazing is that, hotel. Is that and that's, close that's to? An, yeah, that's just it, down the street on Hollywood Boulevard, and that's where the first Academy Awards took place. And is it a 1920s like oh, yeah. Art Deco type? Yeah, Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Place. I might yeah. be thinking of that. Yeah, the the Roosevelt is. But, I'd love to stay at the yeah. Roosevelt. Uh, that's another topic for a future podcast. But I mean, I would sure, be I would be place. shocked if nothing illicit happened at, at Chateau Mormont. But I guess they didn't want anything tragic to happen there so right exactly big yeah legal and tragic I think. yeah exactly they managed and to avoid tragedy yeah yeah when when it was announced that belushi had died they were like oh no brace yourself because the paparazzi was outside and everything interestingly living in the bungalow right next to uh belushi's bungalow story goes that tony randall lived there and had no idea what was going on he's like what who, who died what what and was clueless as to what was happening right next door to his of bungalow. all the people to be living right next to a guy <laughs> tony like tony randall yeah. and john belushi were neighbors and um billy idol tried to claim even though the author of the book said it was kind of dubious but billy idol claims that he had he had a big typical hollywood thing where he trashed his hotel room and everything and the next day he saw police and sirens and all that. And he's like, oh, geez, they're coming to get me. And he was on his balcony looking and watched the whole thing unfold and found out it was Belushi that they had come for. And he's like, whew, yeah, they didn't come for me. <laughs> wow. So that's what Billy Idol claims. See, so. th- this now has become a- – Joe, you keep adding to my list. This is a must visit for me now when I go to L.A. Yeah. And I snuck in. I was in L.A. in April, and I had always wanted to try and sneak in. And so – if you act like you belong there, nobody really questions you. Yeah. So I saw the entrance. There's a sign that says parking, and that's where the you go into the underground garage there. So I, it was middle of the day. I walked in, saw the entrance, just kept going. Nobody said anything. Turned into this spectacular lobby. Uh, there's a piano there that apparently was played by Judy Garland, and people would stay there, would all gather around the piano and play this piano little bar with stools it's just so amazing and i sat down on a, a sofa just soaked it all in imagined all the people coming in and out of this lobby so then i see this guy in a tuxedo mustache look like something out of grand budapest hotel okay. walks up to me i'm thinking oh he's gonna ask me to leave and he's like uh what can i get you sir i was like uh coke would be nice <laughs> come right back uh, he leaves comes back with a coke i'm sitting there sipping my coke i said hey do you have matchbook or anything that says chateau marmont on it and he goes yes i do and he left and he came back gave me a little matchbook wow i left him a big tip and thought well that was cool nice now the bungalow areas that's keyed access you can't just go there and wander through the bungalow area it's very private that's where the swimming pool is and everything uh but i saw a sign that said bungalows this way and uh john belushi's bungalow had a, a separate entrance from a different road you didn't have to go through the hotel to access his bungalow so when he died they actually put his body on a gurney and took him out the rear entrance right. on the back street there and uh, wheeled them off into the ambulance so when you see photos of uh, belushi covered up in a sheet on a gurney that was out back behind the chateau uh wheeling him off to an ambulance where he was already pronounced dead 
I, I don't think I've ever seen what this place looks like, so I'm having a hard time visualizing. So it's very gothic. It looks like is something it, in Europe. Is there like is, there's like a main tower for the hotel, and then like on the property there's bungalows or? So the hotel was first. Um, it originally it was an apartment complex. Then it was a hotel. The hotel was first, and as the owners came and went, they every owner left their mark. So one of the subsequent owners decided to add a couple of bungalows to give residents even more privacy than they got in the hotel. Okay. Later on, another owner added a pool and some more bungalows, and then the current owner added the bar and the restaurant and stuff. Um, so each owner added something new. But, yeah, the bungalows came in after the main building was built, and they acquired more property as they went along. See, okay, okay, I see it now. I got, I got it on Google Maps. Wow, yeah, interesting. It's a really cool place, and it's <laughs> made appearances in other films. La La Land, toward the end of La La Land, when uh, when uh, Emma Stone becomes a star, her and her husband are staying at the chateau, um, and so it appears in other films. I think it appeared in The Doors and okay. uh, several other films. So yeah, I think uh, I, I think when we when we get a bigger budget, we'll start putting the <laughs> the visual cues up on the TV screens <laughs> across the year. So don't you guys worry. Google it. That's uh, right. Like Andrew is right now. Yeah. It, it actually does look kind of spectacular. Yeah. 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 It's it's really, really cool and very gothic and very European. And, you know, it, it, it was pristine in its early days. And then, like everything in the 60s and 70s, it, it survived uh, the riots. There's a Sunset Boulevard riots where the cops came in and clubbed uh, young people and told them to get off the streets. Yeah. And it went through a period where the, the, the carpets were had gaffer's tape on it and oh. torn wallpaper had scotch tape holding it in place like it really went downhill in the 70s and 80s and people didn't think it was going to survive through the 90s and then this current owner i forget his name but he came in and he modernized the place and updated the place and now it's this trendy hip chic place that everyone See, wants to visit now th that feels like the theme for la like of all these classic places that we we've we we're going to mention over the course of the, uh, the show is that Right around the mid '60s and throughout the '70s, just you talk about oh decline. Everything went decline. Yeah. The studios were going to decline. Classic, you know, locations were going to decline. No one knew what was going on. Yeah, back lots yeah. of the studios were torn down. The yeah. Hollywood sign was in ruins. You ever see pictures of the Hollywood oh. signs where letters have fallen over and big panels were missing? This was in the '70s. I didn't see that with my own eyes until the 2000s and i always yeah. thought i was like oh no it always looked that wonderful and glamorous like nope nope no. apparently that wasn't a special effects that was yeah people so, would look into the, and see that i went yeah the deteriorating sign and uh, a great story about that is alice cooper famous detroiter um a bunch of celebrities got together had a big fundraiser alice cooper purchased one of the letters i don't remember which one it was and um, dedicated that letter to his idol, Groucho Marx, if you can believe it. <laughs> I, apparently they were friends during Groucho's last few years on Earth. Wow. Um, but all these celebrities came together. They each bought a letter. Each uh, letter got uh, restored and uh, made pristine and turned into a Hollywood landmark. Really I mean, they, they, that's they, a good they, story. I've never heard that. I never, I never, I, I didn't know that. I mean, yeah. but how did it fall into such disrepair? From just neglect, and uh, really? there was no security. It was covered in graffiti. Um, if you if you go to the Hollywood Museum, I love this place. It's right off of Hollywood Boulevard on Highland. Uh, it's in the old Max Factor building, which was the big makeup guy in Hollywood at the time. Okay. Uh, if you go into the Hollywood Museum, not only do you see cool cars and costumes and props and all sorts of stuff, but they have a large section of the Hollywood sign during that era. And they have it framed and, and on display, but it's covered in graffiti. People sure. walked up there and wrote their name on the Hollywood so, sign, so if you could believe at it. At that time, I don't know if you know, like who was in, who was in charge of main, maintaining that? It was, it was like city? A, a city park? Well, it was erected or? by a developer who was selling plots of land to build like a oh, neighborhood, a oh, subdivision. And that was draw. called Hollywood Land. You've seen yes. the signs Hollywood right. yes. Land. Uh, okay. They eventually tore down the land part. Not like in the Rocketeer when the blimp crashed into yeah. it. That's fiction. But they took down the land part, left the Holly, uh, Hollywood part up. And I don't know who was responsible for maintaining it. Apparently, early on when the sign had light bulbs in it, there was a guy who had access on a ladder and would replace the light bulbs as they went out. But over time, it just got neglected and started to deteriorate. And 
uh, the Chamber of Commerce, they, they were like, well, do we level this thing or do we restore it? And luckily they restored it. And now I believe the Chamber of Commerce owns the copyright on it and is responsible for maintaining it. And now the, you see people come from all yeah. over the world oh, to yeah. take a picture yeah. in front of the Hollywood now, sign. If, if there was a proposition to put forward to put back land on it, would you support it or no? No, no, yeah. because it's so iconic now. Yeah. And I have a crazy story. I don't know if I shared this with you guys, but when I was in L.A. in April, uh, I always try to go back to the Hollywood sign and, and get a photo in front of the Hollywood sign. So I have like 30 years of me standing in front of the Hollywood sign. You could watch me age terribly <laughs> over time. And the last time I went in April, I went to the Hollywood sign. It was on Easter uh, people were bustling all over the place. I was surprised so many people were out there on Easter. There's a dog park just below the uh, the sign. So I went there. It was kind of crowded. I was trying to do some selfies and got a really beautiful shot of the sign. And as I was leaving, I pass an old man who's sweating and panting, and his wife has her hands on his back making sure he's okay. And I was a little concerned. And we passed each other, and I turned around. I followed him back up the hill. And I said, Patrick, is that you? And he turned around and, and smiled at me, and it was Patrick Stewart. <laughs> and uh, at the Hollywood sign, like a typical tourist. <laughs> and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Patrick, is that you? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. I talked to him like, you know, obviously it's like we're lifelong friends or something. <laughs> and I asked him to get a photo with him, but he was sweating and he was panting and there were a lot of people around and, and he didn't want attention brought to him. So he politely declined and I understood. But we chatted briefly and I told him what it great pleasure it was to meet him and he thanked me and we went our separate ways but gotcha. of all places to run into one of the biggest stars in the world wow. the hollywood sign yeah that, that's the magic yeah. of la that's yeah. that's the fun of la that's why it's my happy place i'm surprised the mayor never got involved or even sacramento the government said you know what you guys are doing what you're doing in la I'm, we're taking control yeah. of it it's a historical landmark for california yeah here's funding keep that thing but think about it. You know, Hollywood Boulevard was full of porn shops and sex shops, and every business was was a porn shop. CD. Yeah, if you watch a movie, uh, The Howling, which came out, I think, in yeah. the early 80s, there's some scenes shot on Hollywood Boulevard. Yep. It's porn shop after porn shop after porn shop. New York was the same way. I yep. don't understand why during that time period, 70s and the 80s, <laughs> it just all the seediness time. ran rampant. It's Times Square. Yeah, go, exactly. It's nothing but porn shops and liquor shops. You see all these comedians talk about like, yeah, yeah, this is not the Times Square that we remember. If you went to Times Square, you almost expected to be mugged. Like it was part of the New York tourist experience. Like, hey, get a photo. We're getting mugged here. Hey, That's how bad I things think, were. I think I think uh, our city has that reputation right now and has for the last what, 40 years. But I think it's it's gotten better. It's it's rebounding and it's better but, than it was. But it still has a, a a certain, obviously not as big as, you know, New York or yeah, oh uh, yeah, yeah. But 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 there's a certain uh, specific Detroit. Uh, uh, I, I guess you could say decay or whatever. <laughs> but it draws uh, the hipsters and it draws intellectuals and it draws uh, yeah, artists. It's, it's gentrified now. It's, yeah, it's yeah. gentrifying, which you know has its ups and downs. Uh, but. Uh, but I, I've I've read things of people who have moved from Brooklyn to Detroit saying this is the next Brooklyn. Yeah. So yeah, you know what's funny? When I lived in L.A. back in uh, eighty nine ninety, just to make ends meet, I worked at this warehouse with people um, from California and Hispanics and everything, and we all got along great. And I remember early on sitting in the break room eating a lunch table full of guys, locals and stuff, and they were like, "Where are you from, Joe?" And I said, "Detroit." And they were like, "Ooh, ooh." Calm down, man. Yeah. You know, like they didn't want to get on my bad side. Once they found out I was from Detroit, Detroit had this reputation in LA of don't mess with people from Detroit, which made me laugh. I, I, I was at a, uh, a resort in the, uh, the small town my mom's side of the family lives in, in Georgia. Uh, one of my family members had a membership there. I was swimming in the pool. I was probably 12 or 13 at the time, just talking with one of the kids. And uh, who was swimming there too? And he said, "Where are you from?" And I said, uh, "Detroit." And his immediate reaction, <laughs> it was, it was, uh, it was, it was immediate. It was, it was base. Yeah. He didn't have to think about anything. He goes, "Oh, yeah." He might have said something like, "I'm, I'm sorry," or yeah. something. Like that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's um, just, it's just one of those things. I mean, yeah. to tell you how far the absurdity got, I'm Indian. So, you know, it's not like we ever lived in downtown Detroit. You know, we're like, we're, it's ice cream suburb when you look at me. I visited a friend of mine in, in uh, Ocala, Florida. This is around 2000. We go to an arcade 
when there's still arcades. We, there's this uh, shooting game called Time Crisis where you have to like shoot. I remember out. that. Yeah, you remember Did that? Did it have the action? Yeah. Gun? yeah. Yeah. So my buddy and I were doing really well. He moved down there to visit his family. And so his cousin standing over there and saying, wow, you guys are really good at this game. And she goes, oh, yeah, they're from Detroit. They go, oh, yeah, it makes sense. We both stopped and turned <laughs> over. Are you kidding me? Two Indian guys you playing. Target a- practice yeah. in Detroit. She goes, oh, yeah, they're from Detroit. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Honing your skills. Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I guess we were considered like what, flyover shadiness? Because you got the <laughs> L.A. seediness and New York seediness. But Detroit, no, no, you're not, you don't rank high enough. Right. Yeah, and yeah. and we're, we've always been number two to Chicago in terms of, you know, Midwest. So yeah. we've always had to, to, we've always been the underdog <laughs> in every way. Right. Detroit, Detroit needs versus... its own Chateau Mormont. That's Detroit right. Detroit needs a, yeah. a winning sports team. Damn it. Uh, yeah, that too. Yeah. <laughs> Even though now we're getting way off topic, but I've been lucky growing up in the 80s and stuff. I've seen some of the greatest Detroit sports right. teams of all time. So Tigers, I've been I've been lucky, but now we're going through a dark If we path. had yeah. if we had our film industry yeah, not cut off at its knees, I guarantee exactly. we would have had a Chateau Mormont. I agree. I agree. All right, so we we deviated off topic a little bit. Let's return things back to topic. We don't have a whole lot of time left, but imagine those Pete what was the topic you were bringing to the table today? Well, you know, we're talking about locations. I stumbled upon this, and again, I anything that happens on this show, I blame Joe. <laughs> and I think that's the only appropriate thing. And then I blame Andrew, but I will always blame Joe because Joe will set you on this path. He says, you know, t- take a look. You know, you know, you mentioned the Chateau Mormont. I was like, okay, you know what? Locations. I was going to focus on the what the movie studios did. You know, the kind of like the band. I was thinking like something like Game of Thrones. Nope. Turns out I found the Hacienda Apartments on Sunset Strip, otherwise known <laughs> as the House of Francis, which was infamous was one of the most infamous brothels in all of L.A. Mm-hmm. I mean, the House of Francis it sounds like you can make a comic book movie. Almost <laughs> like, I mean, it's that's a movie right there, man. Yeah. It, it is. And uh, look, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll tell you this. I know we're short on time, but uh, and uh, I will say I recommend to everyone that anyone's watching or listening. There are two books that when I was looking up uh, this topic that just absolutely will will fill your head. It's The Fixers, Eddie Mannix, Howard Strickling, and the MGM Publicity Machine by E.J. Fleming. If you get a chance, go find it. Order it on Amazon or Google. It's, you can get a preview on Google Reads. It's fantastic. And if anyone out there knows this book, it's called The Hollywood Madam, The Most Intimate Recollections of a Hollywood Madam by Francis Lee. If you hmm. can find that book, you are in rare t- company because that book apparently was out of print, and there's a reason for it. You, because You can't find it on Amazon? I mean, every time I look on it, it says out of print, out of stock. Why? Yeah. Andrew, tell me you didn't find it right now. No, no, okay. no, no, <laughs> no. But, and if I did, I, I wouldn't tell you. I would buy it, and then I would tell you I would bought it, and then sell it to you for you know, the highest dollar. So. <laughs> Band of Brothers, Andrew, watch yes. it. You could learn a lot from it. Now, you mentioned the name Mannix. For those of you listening, if it sounds familiar to you, you reminded me that the character is portrayed yeah. by uh, Josh Brolin in Hail, Hail Caesar, Caesar, which yeah. is one of my favorite movies. Oh, so he okay. was the guy covering up pregnancies. and the all, Yeah, he was out there just putting out all these fires at oh, the my studio. God. Joe, I, I'm going to tell you, the, the movie version is the most watered down, <laughs> happy go lucky. He's yeah, the you yeah. know protagonist who's trying to do right. You no, know, he's getting recruited by Boeing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The real Eddie Mannix and Howard Strickling, the stuff that these guys did, it, everything that, uh, let me tell you something, everything that happens right now in LA that's coming with the whole Me Too movement makes sense. You could trace the origins. These, these guys were known as fixers because that's what they did. If yeah. you had any scandal, they fixed it. They were involved with the government, with the cops, with the DA, with the press. They did everything. And the House of Francis in the 1930s, which is what they call, in, in that book, The Fixers, they reference the 30s as, this was our most tumultuous time. Like, we were the most, we were the busiest. And Clark Gable, Joan Crawford, uh, and um, uh, Spencer Tracy. Oh, yeah. Kept them. They were like their Mount Rushmore. Like every day, they had something like, "Okay, please God, don't let anything happen with these." You know, and they would do it. <laughs> and the House of Francis, this brothel, was notorious. Errol Flynn would go there. Spencer Tracy would go there. Errol Flynn was like a notorious yeah. bad boy. And you know, talking, uh, continuing about yeah. the chateau, um, one of the studios, I think, it was the MGM Studios, uh, rented several suites at the chateau for their stars. And said, if you have to get in trouble, get in trouble at the Chateau because they were good at keeping secrets. Yes. <laughs> so guys like Bill Holden and Glenn Ford spent an awful lot of time at the Chateau where things were swept under the rug. Everybody, every studio used this place. They, mm-hmm. they had 
you know, women coming from every woman that young woman wanted to be an actress would come there, but they'd end up becoming here and becoming mm. sex workers or escorts, uh, and they'd pay, yeah. make as much as a thousand dollars a week. Yeah. And Lee Francis was the madam that that balanced everything. She, she, the rumor was, up to forty percent of her profits were paid out to the cops, the DA, the journalists, the government officials, just to keep things operational, just to keep everything sliding. Wow. Mm-hmm. She'd have stuff out there for the cops. The cops would even get some favors. Well, that's why Sunset Boulevard and the Sunset Strip got yeah. to be so popular is because it had a reputation with law enforcement looking the other way. So brothels popped up. Uh, Anything pe- goes. Underage well, wild minors can drink and party yeah. and have fun. And there was a story in the book that I read that a, a woman, this is kind of at the tail end of the, the height of Sunset Strip. There was a woman who was staying at the chateau and overlooking the Sunset Strip and, and – uh, they said, where's all the people? Like, I had read that there should be all these people walking the strip. And they said, well, now everyone drives cars. Not a lot of people walk the strip anymore. Right. She said, you know what? I want to walk the strip. So she went to take a walk on the strip and was propositioned by numerous people who had assumed she was a street walker. Wow. That was the reputation of the Sunset Strip at the time, where if you were a woman walking on Sunset Boulevard, she was there to service you. That's yeah. crazy to me. Yeah. yeah. And that makes an after what you hear has happened on the Sunset Strip, all of that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the House of Francis, you know, all, up until 1940, that's when it got shut down because she, I guess, Lee Francis stopped paying bribes or in, the, in they say the late 30s, around 1939. And in January 1940, the cops raided it, and they went to her house, actually, and, and, and they got her. They arrested her along with a lot of customers and clients that were there having a party. The only time she ever got arrested, after that, she faded into obscurity until she wrote a tell-all book in 1986. And, again, <laughs> got to find it, because I'm pretty sure they were like, nope, can't let this get out. Can't yeah. let this get out. Yeah, when the, when the authorities cracked down on the activities on Sunset Strip, Sunset Strip, that kind of ended its fame and reputation. You go there now, and it's kind of, nobody's there. You kind of, you know, there's clubs and stuff you can go to, but not a very, lot of hustle and bustle on the Strip. Pretty not sanitized. Like hated. Oh, yeah, yeah very, yeah. very sanitized. Um, and that's because the authorities came in and locals were complaining and people's property values were coming down. And there was a, a little uh, club called the Pandora's Box, which has a little cameo in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. You have to look for it and you'll see it. Okay. Um, but that's where miners knew that they can go and hang out and, and uh, drink and stuff like that. And the cops came in and pulled out their batons and cracked skulls and every night they would come out and the young people would come out and and do battle with the cops and (laughs) eventually the cops won and pandora's box got raised because they were trying to take property for freeways and stuff like that and that was sort of the end of of the 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 legend of the sunset strip when the authorities came out with their batons and cracked skulls and that was it and but the house of the house of france was definitely one of the the I mean, the seedy jewels of mm-hmm. the Sunset Strip at that time. And just like anything, just like the Chateau Mormont, it fell into disrepair in the 60s and 70s. A fire in 1983 gutted it. Mm-hmm. Uh. But when this thing was in at an operation, MGM had its own account there so that its clients could go there and so everything would be hush hush. Yeah. Put, put it, just put it on the tab. It's on the MGM yeah, part. Exactly. It, it's almost like when you hear the Wall Street banks go down to the, to the and have escorts. Everything's on the the Goldman Sachs card, allegedly yeah. on the Goldman <laughs> oh, Sachs of course, card. Of course, of course. Yeah. So that was the that's the nature of Sunset Strip and its heyday. I mean, originally it was hip and it was cool and right. you know Dean Martin had a restaurant there called Dino's and and it was the place to see and it was big band and people would wear tuxedos and dresses and stuff and you you went to Ciro's and you went to these famous clubs yeah. Trocadero and other places and then over time it started to evolve and and young people kind of took it over and uh yeah Trocadero that was the club that was owned by Thelma Todd's friend and that was the party that she had gone to the oh, night wow. before yeah, yeah. Oh. So there's there's a little bit of connection to these episodes. I mean, it's okay. all there when we talk about Hollywood crime scene. I mean, yeah. I mean, what what the House of Francis was involved in was was amazing, and they, the the business got so much that they opened up another place called Mays, based on May West, mm-hmm. and MGM oh. opened it up. It was a private location because they said we're spending so much money. Let's just move everyone over there, and they would hire women to look like the actresses that they had. They oh, get yeah. surgical <laughs> surgery done. Yeah. Really? So clients could look and say, hey, I'm really sleeping with Joan Crawford. I did that with air quotes for anyone that can't see. 
They would actually but that have was surgery done to look like. Yep. Yeah, and oh that was God. one of the uh, storylines in uh, the movie L.A. Confidential yes. when uh, the two detectives go to the restaurant and they see the mob guy with uh, Lana Turner. And the one cop says, you know, uh, a hooker cut to look like Lana Turner is still a hooker. And she throws the drink in his face. And Kevin Spacey's character says, that is Lana Turner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and she was mistaken for I a need hooker. To, I need to uh, see uh, uh, oh. what... what what uh, service that's streaming on, because I definitely <laughs> need to watch that. It is. It is. We're going to be referring to that movie a lot. Yes. Yeah. So the, the House of Francis, I mean, there's a lot more that we'll get into. I know we're short on time, but it is, uh, if, if you guys, if anyone wants to read those two books, The Fixers uh, by E.J. Fleming and Hollywood Madam by Francis Lee, if you can find that second book, good on you. Let me know, please. Love that stuff. Okay, because there is so much stuff that go, went on there. I mean, they, they were talking about, you know, people getting abortions and they had to hide them. And you know, you're talking oh, about yeah. bisexual relationships. They had to keep that out of the press. Yep. And the house, of, she had she had information on everybody. So at some point, you know that they were like, okay, the sword of Damocles is going to fall on someone. Like like, like yeah. Jeffrey Epstein. Had, yeah, had something right. on everybody. Or, what's right. her name? Just Lane or whatever. Yeah, I mean, Lane, imagine Gilles, 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 the Lane, books Matthew. that she has with names in it. I mean, I have to imagine someone has or what the burned FBI those has. at some point. They yeah. rate, when they raided Epstein's compound, Ooh, the FBI man. took all the servers now. So we they're wow. just sitting there unless it's like, oh, it's you know gigabytes of nothing. Really yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Andrew, what'd you bring to the table today? Right. Okay, I uh, I brought uh, to the table uh, <laughs> the story of uh, Brittany Murphy. Uh, uh, young actress, well, passed away uh, pretty young, uh, fairly young, 32. Yeah. Uh, uh, I was never super familiar with her. I just remember her, you know, just being a uh, a, a hot young actress, just, you know, a couple years older than me. She was in Clueless, which uh, right. made her a, yeah. a pretty that, common. Uh, uh, apparently, that was her breakout role. I've never seen yeah. Clueless. And <sighs> looking at her, her filmography, the only movie I've seen, and she has. A very small role in it because everybody's in this movie is Sin City. Sin City yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm not really familiar with her at all, but her death is very interesting. So I'm just gonna kind of go more towards that. Uh, uh, apparently, uh, the press and uh, people in the public had said that she looked like she uh, was on drugs because she looked uh, very sick, thin, and very thin. Yeah. anorexic yes. almost. Yeah, yeah. It was yep. compared to her clueless years, mm-hmm. you know. And um, I don't. I don't know, maybe even like uh, eating disorder, and I know that's still a very common thing. Um, I, but I don't know if, if that was a thing with her, but uh, allegedly, yeah, it, allegedly, it, it'd be so, par for the course for Hollywood. Anyway, uh, she married a dude uh, named Simon Monjack, um, who uh, who is involved in Hollywood somehow, you know, behind the scenes type of guy. Um, and she uh, she had passed away. Um, yeah, it was very sudden. And, yeah, yeah, very it's sudden. One of those deals where you're like, "Wait, are they talking about this, the clueless actress? Like, right. really?" Right. So it was it was a couple days before Christmas, 2009, and early in the morning, um, she was found uh, you know, unresponsive by her husband, Monjack. Uh, they took her to Cedar Sinai, which is uh, a very popular uh, hospital there in the city, um, and apparently she died from cardiac arrest. Um, the cause of death was officially pneumonia but what they found in her system was let's see if i have the list here elevated ele- elevated levels of hydrocodone oh as- wow as- acetaminophen okay l methamphetamine and chlorpheniferamine <laughs> i don't know what that last one is they're all legal uh but apparently never be mixed no uh, yeah especially with the vicodin and the uh Meth- whatever that L methamphetamine is, but apparently she was had a really bad respiratory infection, hmm. uh, so she passed away officially uh, per the doctors of pneumonia. Um, Oddly, none of those are are antibiotics that would help fight that respiratory yeah, infection. So, oh. Right. So and, and a lot you know, of those we, can cause respiratory uh, distress. Right. Okay, so uh, five months. Uh, almost to the day, five months later, her husband in the same house dies from the same exact thing, mm. which I think is pretty interesting. Yeah. So apparently he, his death was attributed to acute pneumonia and severe anemia, which also I failed to mention she also had anemia. Wow. That's so weird. <laughs> was his house built on an ancient uh, Native American <laughs> burial site or what? So, uh, I mean, it gets weirder. 
um, uh, uh, Britney's father uh, tried to sue, saying uh, that uh, you know I, I want I want you to exhume her and get a lock of her hair because mm-hmm. uh, you know I think something might have happened. So in November of 2013, he did get a toxicology report. Wow! And well, he claimed that he has a report showed that she was deliberately poisoned by heavy metals, including an- antimony. I haven't Antinamide? heard of it. Is it antimony? I a- antimony. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I thought that is, is that like alimony or? <laughs> I don't know. I've only seen it in print. I don't think yeah. I've ever. Yeah, really I haven't spoken, either. But. And barium, which I know is, on, yeah. is an element, but I don't know yeah, what yeah. it is. And was a possible cause of his daughter's death. So what um, was he saying? What was he accusing somebody of? Of of, of so just he, someone just trying to kill her. Wow. So he's accusing the LAPD and the Dis- California District Attorney of incompetence, basically, of mis- of classifying it as a oh, it's just a yeah accidental death of pneumonia, no natural causes, and then you could say bury him and yeah. Now, is there a reason uh, someone would have wanted her? Out of the not, way? Not, not, not that I. That's so bizarre. Um, not that I know of. So first, I share with you her her dad's point of view, which seems kind of kind of far fetched. Now her mother, her name is. Uh, well, it doesn't matter what her name is. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Sharon Murphy. Okay. She said that, um, that the health the health department. Uh, she she had, the health department, uh, or asked them to check the house for dangerous mold that may have caused, like, a respiratory right. thing. Um, and then, uh, I guess, uh, two years later, after she had died, the the mother had said, I'm, I'm convinced that it was the mold that killed wow. my daughter. But nothing, nothing since then has come about it. Yeah, no, I remember, <laughs> you know, during that time period, there wasn't a lot of uh, talk of toxic mold and all that. It seemed like only... More recently, has that become a huge concern where right. if your home experiences a flood and you get that black mold, yeah, yeah. I didn't realize until within the last decade or so that pe- that kills people. So yeah, but it, it, it's it might not death. have been, yeah, yeah. Especially when you're wealthy and, and well-known and you yeah. the moment you start to feel off, if she was working at a movie studio or she was on you know working on a project, they'd, yeah. they'd, her agent or manager would be like, uh, Brittany, you got to go. Yeah. This is not standard you know, eating disorder stuff that I, that I yeah. have you on. Um, and and then I I ha- haven't watched this, but uh, in October of last year, HBO Max came out with a documentary called uh, "What Happened, Brittany Murphy." Yeah. Or yeah, what oh, happened? Okay, well that's I'm watching that tonight then. And uh, and I didn't know this, but she was also in Eight Mile, and which oh yeah, I, yeah. I also have never seen. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a documentary. He's confessing to a lot of things on this show, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta get um, you up to speed. And it it does say uh, a quote about the the documentary that uh. That Brittany deserved better than the treatment she received in the media, which probably probably contributed to her husband's ability to control her in the way he did. Hmm. So there might have been some mental, emotional hmm. stuff going on there between the two, uh, which might have led her to uh, you know seek out drugs or you know whatever yeah. was going on. But uh, yeah. I would I I would like to you know do a little bit if that's the deeper case, dive if, in. if they. If they believe that the husband contributed in such a significant way to her death, then is his death revenge killing, allegedly? I mean, is that a, for him to die in the exact same house yeah, in the exact so same odd. way? It sounds like <laughs> karma more than anything. Right. Yeah. I, don't know. I just I thought it was an interesting coincidence. Um, yeah. You know, five they died five months apart from the same thing. Yeah. The mom probably has a, a logical reason to say, hey, Sounds, you know, yeah. some, something was messed up with their lungs. They both had uh, acute anemia, which I don't know what that would But if it was, co- I mean, an, anemia is, you know, usually it's, it's it's not just blood loss. It's because, you know, you have a low blood count. Yeah. You, you know, it could yeah. be bone marrow problems. It could be from poisoning could do that. So, Some yeah. types of poisoning can do I that. Just, uh, I, I remember when that story broke, what, thir- 13 years ago or so, I remember – Hearing about it, and I'm like, oh, I know who she is. Yeah, I, I saw her in that one thing one time. You know, see, but beautiful, for- beautiful woman. Uh, I, I could see her going on being, yeah, you know, being pretty big. And then I remember n- never having any uh, conscious like closure about what actually happened because I remember hearing something different uh, yeah. not long after that she had passed away. Uh, so I wanted to just kind of revisit that to see if anything had yeah. been resolved and nothing yet. But well, What's your conclusion? I mean, based on 
your reading and in, in, uh, investigation, what what do you think is the likely conclusion? I Does think the, the mold I, sound like I, the most. I, uh, I, I think yeah, I think it was it was probably a, a, like a long, like a slow thing that got yeah. both of them. Yeah, but she was definitely weakened with something else. Yeah, whether it was. Drug use. Drug or, use. Yeah. Uh, oh, come and, on, Andrew. And, jump off the crazy and, branch. Listen, and, and, uh, you know, uh, don't be rational about this. And, uh, an emotional, <laughs> an emotional thing that brought her down physically. Like apparently, the way uh, her, mm-hmm. her husband, husband allegedly treated her. Uh, we'll, we'll know more, I guess, if we watch the documentary. Mm-hmm. Um, Go full Harvey Weinstein but, on this. But, Let's loop but, him into this. But, but <laughs> I mean, ultimately, it was. I think ultimately it was that mixture of, of Vicodin and yeah. you know the. Yeah. I mean, the, she, she probably took a little bit too much, right. even though she, you know it was all legal and it was all prescribed. That's exactly um, what we were talking about earlier. There's just the over yeah. prescribing of medications, and, 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 and even if it's not prescribed, if if oh, you're you, fa- if you take, you're, you take a friend's, if you're uh, one third of the way famous, you can get whatever you want. Exactly. You know? right. So, yeah, it, it's horrible. So yeah, that uh, that's a, a good way to end the uh, the podcast on. Those taken from us uh, far too young an age. Uh, here's someone who, based on the success of Clueless, could have used that to catapult her to stardom. And unfortunately, uh, her her life and, and career went in the other direction. And you know, it's just heartbreaking. It just mm-hmm. occurred to me, I did not pay attention to the assignment. Because <laughs> you mentioned people that were taken too early. You brought some of those taken too early. I mentioned the brothel. That's all right. <laughs> it all kind of tied into the chateau and all that other stuff. And uh yeah, I mean, we could do a whole podcast just on the Sunset Strip. It's yeah. amazing history, and um, yeah, and there's just no shortage of stories for us to talk about on this podcast. So, yep. Yep. Uh, any final thoughts before we kind of wind things up here? No, I'm I'm uh, I am not going to be done with this uh, topic, unfortunately, because now, like I said, once you get me started on chasing these <laughs> things, I, I just keep I keep pulling on the thread. I'm like, oh wow, there's more and there's more. Look, I, for anyone that can see, I have pages of this stuff pages and uh, yeah and it's you know obviously we're going to be do, covering another topic because we have to because you know we're responsible and, you know, <laughs> but we will i promise we'll revisit some of the stuff at, in, in a future because some of these do overlap well it's funny you know you, we've used the term rabbit hole where you start on one thing and then you learn about other things you know and reading that book uh the castle on sunset and reading all the sordid scandals and stories that went on there, that led to all kinds of ideas for topics for future podcasts um, from the whole uh, uh, Jean Harlow story, yeah. her ex-husband who died a mysterious death, and John Belushi and, uh, and Jim Morrison and all the, all the people that are connected to that hotel is going to be uh, fodder for future podcasts. I mean, so, we, could nice. do, we could do an entire show on just these fixers, Eddie Maddox and Howard Strickling, and just, yeah. just what they've done. Because they, their story comes from the 20s all the way to the 50s. Yeah. Exactly. Right until, like, the decline of the, the major studios when MGM and all those guys are starting to, like, fall by the wayside. Hmm. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, another great one. Uh, Imagine host Pete, Andrew Walker. Thanks for joining me today. Joe Thank Johnson, you. Thank you for Thank having you. us, yes. as always. I'm really in my element here. I really enjoy our conversations here. So we will see you again uh, real soon. Yes.